you should see it pop. Well, actually, you're a host. So you probably won't see it, but I see it. Okay, good. It's, we are in Pennsylvania, and I have to put that up. Otherwise, it's a felony. So. Oh, I forgot to record my class today. Mike, I was teaching a criminal justice class today, and none of the students are interested. They're not going into it. They're just it's an, just an elective. And it was moderately depressing because I asked about the uh, in, in uh, impeachment proceedings. No one's tracking any of it, really. Oh, my God, I have it in the background. Well, you know, For we're particularly reasons. proud because that's my former district attorney who was making that argument yesterday. From the well, so yeah, yeah. that was hey, great. Which which district attorney? Was yours Bruce Castor? Oh, that's he was that. the... so you're being facetious. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> I was like, what? I didn't watch much of it. I just caught the highlights. I was like, hmm. But you know, it's for, for a variety of reasons. The students were not engaged in it. Do you? Okay, so we are. Uh, welcome everybody to this monthly meeting for BJA grantees under the Upholding the Rule of Law and Wrongful Conviction Prevention Programs. Um, this program is made possible from the BJA because we are a technical training assistance provider under that grant. And we provide these meetings every month for folks who are doing post-conviction work, whether under the grant or not, both to kind of have some time to talk to each other occasionally, but also to hear from experts in the field on issues that are pertinent to the work that you're doing. Um, so today we are, I'm just really thrilled to have Dr. Gary David with us. Um, Dr. David is not an attorney, so you know, please don't ask him about ethics or legal issues involving discussions with pro se applicants or others, but he is an expert on communication and particularly design issues. So if you think design really has only to do with your houses, you're wrong. There are issues that we now know about that can help foster communications um, with folks just by how things are laid out on a page or on a screen. And so Dr. David has been very, very generous with his time with us at the center and with many on this call, helping to redesign some of the communication tools you use, particularly with people who are um, incarcerated or um, pro se or seeking your services. And by redesigning our communication tools, what we found out is that it both can increase the information you are getting as practitioners, which then makes your job easier to be able to suss out in the information you need versus what you don't. So to improve your own abilities. So what we know is that it can both increase the person's confidence and comfort level in terms of the communications with you as practitioners, but also increases your efficiency as practitioners because you're getting to the information you need quicker and in a better fashion. So I'm just absolutely thrilled, uh, Gary, that you could join us today. Um, He's got some some slides presented and, and ready to do, but I know that he would much rather be answering your direct questions. So please feel free to use the chat for that. I will be watching it. Um, since there's so many of us, I'm not gonna ask that you unmute and, and vocalize because it does get a little confusing, but please put any questions you've got in the chat and I'll make sure that Gary hears about them. So I am handing off to Dr. Gary David. Thanks Gary for joining us today. Thank you very much. And you can ask me whatever questions you like about the issues that Marissa raised. I will not guarantee my answers are accurate or correct, but you can feel free. I mean, it's never stopped a professor before from answering a question. Fair we, enough. We don't know, especially a sociologist. Uh, so thanks everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, I, I, I really welcome the opportunity to chat with you all about, and I'll start sharing slides in a second, about this, this topic of both design thinking participatory action research and participatory design, uh, human-centered design. There's a lot of names floating around and I don't know how familiar people are with this terminology. It gets a little confusing, but it's actually kind of talking about the same thing, especially as it relates to legal design. And I, I by no means profess to be an expert in legal design. I do more work in customer experience and employee experience and uh, experience design in general which I can talk about. I work at a school called Bentley University, which is just outside of Boston. It's a private business university. And experience design, as we'll talk about, is a way of thinking about how we create experiences, uh, uh, not just at one point of contact, but across multiple points of contact within a kind of ecosystem or experiential environment. 
And I also, as I'll talk about shortly, I teach a course on criminal and social justice. I've done work within the legal system uh, examining police interrogations, which I'll talk about a little bit just to give you a sense of, of where I'm coming from. But again, uh, feel free to ask questions if you don't want to unmute yourself for any particular reason. I have the chat box open in front of me. Uh, you know, I've, I'm a professor. I'm on Zoom all the time, as we all unfortunately are. Uh, at the beginning, Zoom was like, oh, this is so cool. This is so interesting. And now we've reached that point where we're like, oh my God, not again. Why won't this thing do what I want? So if you have any questions, by all means, raise your hand virtually, physically, or just use the chat box and we will try to get at them. And hopefully the more dialogue, absolutely the better. As I said, I am, let me make the, uh, my box. I'm, I have three screens going, so I apologize. And I apologize for the massive headphones, but I have you know three kids at home and a wife who's a cl clinical social worker. So I'm trying to block out <laughs> the ambient noise that's happening. So that's why I have the big cans on my head right now. So talking about this issue of legal design and client communications, and as, as Marissa was talking about, trying to create not just better communication, but also rethinking how we approach communication how we envision the communicative act, so to speak, from a variety of different perspectives and stakeholder needs so that we can better align how we go about gathering this information. And obviously, as we'll talk about, it gets tricky because sometimes it is a zero sum game. I'm a professor. Sometimes I'm communicating, I'm writing a syllabus, for instance. We think of a syllabus as a, like a legal kind of document, which in some ways it is. There are things that my school says I need to have in there. There are things I want to put in there. There are things that students want to see in there. And so this one document can serve a variety of different groups, all of whom have different needs. And so balancing those needs as those a kind of design approach becomes really, really tricky and potentially complicated. So we're going to try to provide some examples of how to, how to approach this to at least begin the rethinking process and also realize that even making small changes can result in big impacts. And I can, along with some of the legal examples that I have, I can also talk about things that I've done with something called um, course co-design at the, at the uh, university level where you actually get the students to co-create the materials that they're using, both assignments and syllabi as so they increase their engagement, ownership, understanding, and overall experience uh, of the course. Let me see here. So a little bit more about myself. I belong with being a professor. I do consulting work through a company that I created called Ethnoanalytics. And the main purpose of this organization is designing integrative experiences through collaborative creativity within complex systems. I, as a PhD in sociology from Wayne State University in Detroit, I don't know if we have any Detroit people on the call. If we do, hi. Anybody? No, that's okay. Um, we love you anyway. Nope, we sure do. We've got Val and Marla are both on, so they're Detroit folks. All right, Val and Marla, good to, good to see you. We can talk about where we went to high school later. Uh, I, as a sociologist, I look at things from a systems perspective. I like to see how things are integrated and tied together. And in design thinking, often that can get lost if we don't take that 30,000 foot view. So the work that I do both as a sociologist and as a person who teaches in our user experience graduate program and as a consultant, this is kind of the approach I take is trying to create collaborative environments in which people can jointly problem solve to create better solutions. A real quick mention of some of the work that I do that I'm you know, happy to talk about if people have any questions on it or at some other time. Uh, I've published some materials on my work examining police interrogations. I'm, a, I'm trained in something called conversation analysis, which without going into too much detail, unless people wanna hear more about it, we look at the details of interactions and not just what people are saying but also all the, what we would say, constitutive features, the pauses, the overlaps, the intonation risings and fallings, um, 
how things are constructed turn by turn, and also silences, how silences are used. Looking at those things as ways of understanding how people communicate with each other and meaning is produced jointly, collaboratively. One of the things I say about police interrogations is that they're collaborative storytellings. By that I mean the, you know, the people doing the interrogation are involved in the construction of the outcome just by virtue of the fact that they're speaking together. And then the work that I've done, including being trained in the read technique, the peace method, and looking at the interrogation literature is understanding how that happens. And so there, these are two articles, or one chapter, one article, happy to make these available if people want to see them. Playing the interrogation game, rapport, coercion, and confessions in police interrogations, as well as disbelief repeats as deception tagging. And all a disbelief repeat is, anybody who has children will know the situation where you ask your child, did you eat all the cookies? No, I didn't eat the cookies. You didn't eat the cookies? <laughs> Repeating what the person says in the form of a question as a way of tagging that what they just said isn't quite believable. Right? You, have a, you have further questions as the veracity of whether or not the, the, the suspect, in this case, your child, and whether or not that child ate all, ate all the cookies. And part of this work that I've been doing, I've, I've worked, as I, sh I should have mentioned, Jim Train. I don't know if folks are familiar with Jim Train or not. <clears throat> But Jim and I have worked together, pardon me, on a lot of different cases. Um, me looking at the interactions between police and or in person doing the interrogation and suspect, and Jim also looking at the policing practices um, that were involved in those cases. Part of that work is what I call a statement element assessment, where looking at what the confession looks like and then going back into the, the transcript and ideally the recording to identify how these things were produced and how in the, the, the subsequent tellings of, the, of that event, things can shift a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean things like, um, if a suspect says, you know, I think, I think it, you know, uh, it might've been a blue dress. And then in the police report, it says a suspect confirmed it was a blue dress. Conversationally speaking, that's not exactly what took place. It doesn't mean that it's an invalid confession. It just means that the features of talk actually represent a different kind of speech act than what was retold subsequently in reports. So part of that work that I've done with Jim and with, with others, um, it, both on my own, is looking at how the story unfolds and how details of the confession as a collaborative storytelling become surfaced in the, in the reports and the retellings that are subsequent to the confession. And when I say conversation analysis, one of the things that we do in conversation analysis is we, try, we take transcripts and we actually provide details of talk that are hearable in, in the audio or video and we represent them on the transcript. Usually transcripts you see, and this also goes to communication and legal design. I mean, we're already starting to get into this issue of how communicative materials are designed and how that design conveys certain kinds of information and leaves out others. So one of the things we see here is these pauses, these overlaps, nonverbal gestures, uh, interruptions, all as features that are important when we communicate with each other in any context, but all and, and as an extension are important in interrogation context as well. And so part of my work when I do this kind of work is taking the transcript and actually putting back in those features that the people who are interacting with each other are relying on in the actual interaction itself. Because the transcript just as it's typically written as a legal document, doesn't provide you with that information, even though the interactants were relying on that information with speaking to one another. Let me pause there really quick as I take a drink. Um, any questions or anything so far just on this background stuff? If, if anybody would like any more information on any of this, I'm happy to provide it to you.
All right. So let's go into this idea of legal design. Have, have people, by the way, have people heard about legal design before? I'm kind of curious. I'm going to open up the participant window. And if you've heard about legal design, you can click on the, the, on the yes button. And if you have never heard of it before, you can click on the no button. And I'm just kind of looking at it right now at the participant window to see what folks are, are saying. If you've heard of legal design before, click yes. If you haven't, just click no. I'm gonna take the silences as no's. <laughs> so thanks for those who are actually uh, doing it. So some people in chat are saying no, that's great. Well, this is good because then I can say anything about it I want and no one will know if I'm right or not. That's always takes a little pressure off. It's, it's I've, I first heard of it. So in my school, we have a law department and we don't have a law school, but we have, you know, it's a business school. So we have professors that teach a variety, a variety of types of law, mostly centered around business, but also other areas of the law. And one of my colleagues came to me and she said, I'm really interested in legal design. What's that? And she was saying that part of legal design is in essence, trying to make like documentation easier to read. I recently refinanced my mortgage. It was clear that those documents were not written for me. <laughs> they were written for somebody else. I've done a lot of research on medical records, not like studying medical records as an epidemiologist, but the creation and use of medical records. And it's very clear that medical records are written primarily for the physician. Even when those records are provided for patients, they really aren't necessarily a complete representation of the event that took place and don't necessarily further patient health literacy. And when we look at documentation in institutional settings, whether it be a contract, a medical record, uh, any other kind of material that's required in, by that institution, typically those documents are set up with the institution in mind and not the user in mind, not the person who is who's relying on those documentations as a lay person, right? And the law is well known for this, of course that anytime people look at you know, a legal document, if you're not a lawyer, you start to wonder who really speaks like this? Why is it written this way? Why didn't you just use you know, plain language? And so part of legal design is this idea of trying to use plain language, trying to communicate in terms that others can understand who do not have that kind of domain knowledge. And faculty, academics are, huge uh, violators of this rule as well. Usually we speak in terms of academics. We speak as other academics speak. This is why no one often listens to us because we're impossible to understand. And so when we think about how do we translate, and this becomes a translation exercise, how do we translate what it is we're trying to communicate with a greater attention to those others who are also existing in this space. So legal design is a set of tools aimed to design better products and to better communicate legal information to users and stakeholders. And is, we'll talk about both. Uh, users here is a little bit of a loaded term. It's from a UX website, so that's why they use users. You could say clients. Uh, you could say, I mean, I don't know what other legal terms we might use uh, for, the, for, the, for the target audiences for the materials we rely on to communicate with one another. But the idea here is to figure out how do we create better designs and therefore better experiences. There's a really nice website uh, called Law by Design. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it before and a book by Margaret Hagen who lays out a lot of features, integrating design thinking, this idea of design thinking, which I'll talk a little bit about, in with uh, the work of the law, the work of legal institutions. And clearly, legal institutions here is a pretty broad category. Um, you know, from policing to, um, you know, just even 
managing contracts to managing um, court processes, et cetera. It's, it's a, obviously a big ecosystem. And so it's across that environment trying to figure out how do we, you know, number one, help the layperson and the legal profession. And I think it's a really key point here. Very, so very often in customer experience or even where I live in student experience, faculty or workers can feel like the onus is on us to make the lives of others, their customers or students better at our own expense. And that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is, especially in the way that I approach this, is how do we look at all the stakeholders in a space, what, what their needs are, what they need to accomplish through the documentation and through these communication channels, and how can we find some middle ground, some medium, some strategies to meet those needs and not just rely on what, not just prioritize one set of needs so far over the others that the other group becomes completely disenfranchised from the process. So in a way, it's not just about, you know, designing better things just for the sake of designing better things. It's also how to create more just processes, more inclusive processes, so that people don't feel so alienated from those processes to begin with. Also creating a better front end to the legal system and a better back end. And working for incremental short-term improvements and breakthrough long-term change. And that's another really critical piece that I referenced earlier. Is this idea that we are trying to not just make these big, what would be called like a moonshot transformation, but even, and I'll have, I'll have examples of this, even little things, small tweaks, small modifications can make big changes in people's experiences, which then, you know, uh, collectively make some broader transformations, along with the fundamental transformation that occurs when we start to consider these other stakeholders in the work we're doing. That's also a big piece. And it wouldn't be, you know, a, a presentation without a Venn diagram. So design, how to, design to make things people can use and want to use, tech to increase the effectiveness of people's actions, and law to promote fair, a fair and just society and to empower people. And in the middle of that, ideally, is that sweet spot of, of legal design. Again, let me pause there. Any, any questions, comments, reactions, anything I'm moving too quickly to? or other points that people would like to raise, you can feel free to use the chat or feel free to raise your virtual or real hands as well. Clear so far? Is this good? Great. Whoop, this one. A big, one of the terms you'll hear often is this term called human-centered design. It's a, it's a recent term for a long-standing approach. So there's not, there's, as a sociologist and as an ethnographer, there's nothing new in this really. But it's another way of, of thinking about how we go, how we approach design. <clears throat> there's a company called IDEO, which is located in, um, Palo Alto, California, I believe. It's, it, it emerged out of the Stanford D School, the Stanford Design School. And actually there's a, there's a design, there's a legal design program. That's a combination of the Stanford Law School. For those of you who haven't heard of Stanford, it's a school out in California. It's kind of outside of San Francisco. Uh, it's, it's a legal, it's a combination of the Stanford Law School and the design school to create a legal design um, you know, center. And they have a really nice website, not surprisingly, that goes through a lot of these elements as well. But the idea behind human-centered design is that number one, we treat people like humans and we understand that the humans for whom we are designing often have ideas and expertise that we should draw upon to create solutions to the challenges we're trying to overcome. Rather than designing at people, this is the way I describe it. Rather than designing at people or for people, we're designing with people. And they are included 
in that design process as a fundamental component to it. I'll talk a little bit more about that from this area of work called participatory action research, which emerged out of sociology. But the phases in this are inspiration. You'll learn how to better understand people, always a good thing. You'll observe their lives. So understanding typically happens through direct observation using ethnographic techniques in context to see how they're experiencing the, the, their world and the solutions we're trying to design for them. Hear their hopes and desires and get smart on your challenge. We, people speak of design challenges. So you'll hear that term a lot. Ideation, here you'll make sense of everything that you've heard, generate tons of ideas, identify opportunities for design and test and refine your solutions. And when people think about brainstorming or you see design situations where there's like whiteboards with stuff you know, all over the place or you know, post-it notes everywhere. I think one of the biggest beneficiaries of design thinking was 3M in the post-it note. Uh, and so that's like people just creating <clears throat> all sorts of ideas, which might be really far-fetched. The more far-fetched, the better. That's that divergence phase you see at the bottom. And then convergence phase is from those crazy ideas, narrowing them down to a smaller set of ideas going through that process again until you get to implementation, which is now, now is your chance to bring your solutions to life, figuring out how to get your ideas to market and maximize its impact in the world. This is an ideal sense of human-centered design, but what the thing I want you to take away from it, which is really important, is thinking in terms of how other people are experiencing the world and the materials that we are creating for them to use. That's really the crucial element here. And you don't have to go through all of this to enter into this kind of human-centered design mindset or to have this like this human-centricness. The idea of that inspiration piece and then even small i ideation implementation can be enough to have substantive changes happen in your organizations and in your efforts. And so that's why I broke it down here into this basic kind of cycle. Focusing on people, looking at their needs, developing empathy for them, understanding of where they're at and what they're coming from and what challenges they're facing. From that, creating ideas, ideation, developing prototypes, examples of what it is we might want to build that can then be tested and shared with the people we're designing for, which starts that cycle over again. And so it's this inclusivity, inclusion, right? That element of bringing people into the process that becomes a really crucial element of human-centered design, participatory design, participatory action research, and legal design is bringing people in. And by people, we'll talk about what that means in a second, but the stakeholders, who are touched upon in this process. Again, let me pause there. That's a lot. <clears throat> let me see if there's any questions, comments, reactions, or thoughts about anything we've said so far. Uh, feel free to use the chat or also feel free to uh, raise your hand or, or just start uh, chatting. I heard a microphone go off. Le, 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 Lee, Leanne? No. Do you have a question? Oh, that was a false microphone. That happens. False microphones happen. And that's always a little scary. I understand. And so when we get to the examples, maybe folks have some ideas. Going on to this you know, area of traditional approaches to design is likely to situate the people being designed for as object of study in order to better understand their needs and opportunities for design. So design thinking as, a, as an approach, which you might have heard that term before, people are being studied as, as objects. So we go to their workplaces, we go to their homes, we go to you know, where, they're, where, where they're engaged in some activity. 
or are we bring them to the lab, a design lab, uh, a human, um, like a user experience lab, like we have at my school, we have, a, we have a user experience center. We bring them in, we have them use something, we observe them, like almost like testing, and then we take that information and then we separately go back out and redesign what it is we're trying to create. That's traditional design. Participatory design, which human-centered design falls under that umbrella, bring in the people who are being studied as full participants in the research design, data collection, analysis, reporting, and prototyping process. And I'll tell a story, I'll show some examples of working with uh, an innocent project organization on modifying some of their materials. And one of the points that I was saying is if we really wanted to make this a participatory design approach, we would include the very people we're designing for as part of the design process, whoever they are, as much as we could. We would get them to help contribute to building prototypes, to building, to, you know, to ideating new approaches and ideas. They would be full partners in this process and even telling us where the problems are and what kinds of things should we look at. Very often, we might not even know where the problems exist or what we think might be problematic might not be the major issue that people are facing. So it becomes, it becomes important to include those folks as early on as possible, whenever possible, so that as we go through that design process, we can have a better outcome at the very end of it. And this is, from, this is my quote here. This pulls into this area of experience design. And I'm gonna give this definition and I'll show you like what I mean by it. But it's this intentional creation of an overall encounter and experience through a sequential series of integrative moments embedded in a particular contextual ecosystem. Like I said, academics talk weird. But the idea here is that if you think about whoever you're dealing with in your organization, not as a particular moment in time, but as a journey. And so a big part of doing design thinking is this thing called journey mapping. And we can think about what's happening before they come to us and what happens after and all the points along the way in which we're engaged with them. And we're not only thinking about those points, we're also thinking about what their goals are, what their needs are, what their fears are, what their emotional state might be, what they're trying to accomplish, as well as what we're trying to accomplish as well. Adele says, could you use this method for interviewing witnesses who you do not know? Uh, yes. So when, and I'm going to type in a term into the chat. Usually a lot of this work refers to this idea of ethnographic interviewing. And, and ethnographic interviewing tends to be around more open-ended um, questions that are aiming to understand people's lived experiences and culture. And I don't know, Adele, it's an interesting question. I don't know to what extent people have tried to use design thinking approaches in games, I say games, a small g, as a way of trying to get people to become engaged. Now with children, you'll find, you know, uh, when people are, are questioning children using art therapy. Well, art, art approaches are a, a data collection technique that are used in design thinking, collaging, for instance, or um, storyboarding, or uh, creating your graphical representations of things to try to extract more information out of them because we're really bad at articulating things in our minds. Was someone else gonna say something? Another question? And so Adele, it's, it's a really good point. And I do think you, we absolutely could use this for interviewing witnesses, but I don't know if anybody has. And so that, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, my email is at the end of this. I'm happy to chat offline about that, but that's like the kind of brainstorming element we've been talking about <clears throat> with these approaches. And when we're thinking about designing in complex environments, which I don't have to tell you, 
The law is a very complex environment. Criminal justice is a very complex environment. It's a really challenging environment because of all the stakeholders involved and the ways in which the environment can change quickly. And by stakeholders, I mean, yeah, I think Adele, I think it'd be fun too. I mean, I'm always interested in, you know, trying to see how we can apply this stuff for bro broader purposes than how to sell people more iPhones or Androids, right? Because I do think that there's an important element here of connection that's provided by these kinds of approaches. And going back to the complex systems point, and I'm going to show you a, a, an environment, an ecosystem map in a second, which might make people's heads explode. And so there's a trigger warning. I do apologize. But things can get really complicated really quickly. And then it becomes a question of like, how, what, like, what, how do you cut off a piece of this to make it more, um, more actionable? <clears throat> so this was something I found online before, St. Louis Region Criminal Justice Resource Ecosystem Map. I can't pretend to tell you all it means, <laughs> but I'm guessing for many of you who work in the criminal justice system, you can look at this and go, oh yeah, okay. Uh, I, I, have a, I have an understanding of what they're trying to, to engage in. So if you're looking at all the stakeholders, and this probably is not complete, but if you're looking at all the stakeholders and all the constituencies and all the groups who are involved in the criminal justice resource ecosystem map of the St. Louis region, here you go. And I will even say one of the things that this map is leaving out are how these major nodes, the hubs, I should say, are not connected to each other. Because, you know, law enforcement resources being connected to, um, I don't know, crime victims or, uh, you know, mental health being connected over to family support, right? These things are interconnected, so it becomes really complicated really quickly. And this can feel really overwhelming. So like, well, okay, what do we do? Do we have to bring all these people together? Uh, what, I, the way I, Marissa and I met, she was on my podcast um, that's called Experience by Design. One of the people who was also on the podcast recently was a gentleman named Jarrell Coleman, who is graduated from Stanford. And he has a social design consultancy. And he engaged in using design thinking, I believe with the Santa Clara County, um, Santa Clara County around criminal justice reform. And so if one was to do a broader based, larger effort, design thinking oriented approach, one would want to try to get as many stakeholders in as possible. At the same time, that's not always practical because it can be very labor intensive and time intensive. And usually two things in really short supply are labor and time. So I don't show you this to say, this is what you have to do, but I show you this to say, this is how complicated it can become. But I also wanna show how simple it can be to utilize this mindset to achieve some really practical and tangible results that you can do relatively quickly. And this goes to this, this approach that I call IDEA, Integrated Design and Experience Alignment. Breaking it down into six steps, identify the people you are in the ecosystem, engage with them through conversations, try to create alignment around what they're telling you their needs are and what they're trying to accomplish. Design solutions, deploy those solutions and evaluate the outcomes. Even though this is six steps, it can move through, especially on a smaller level, relatively quickly without having to take much time. So let me pause here for a second before we get into any, any the examples I have, which hopefully will bring it home and concretize it for you all to say, oh, okay, now I can see like what we're talking about here. Any, any questions, any confusions, any clarifications I should be bringing that anybody has, feel free to use the chat again, or feel free to raise your hand and we can enter into a, a discussion around it. All right, well, we'll, we'll see if this shakes anything loose. 
And I'd like Marissa, I'd like you to talk about this as well, because we were involved in this together. Be Marissa and I, um, well, I don't know, Marissa, do you want to tell this part of the story about the Florida? Or I should ask Shelly to join us, because this is really comes from work that we worked with with her. Um, so Shelly Thibodeau runs the um, Conviction Integrity Unit in, in Florida, in Jacksonville. Um, and we were working together to try to improve the petition that they were using that's being sent out to pro se applicants, because what we were finding was that the information they were getting back was not really helping Shelly and her team kind of dig down and find out what cases they could move on quickly, what cases they couldn't move on quickly. And we wanted to kind of see if we could improve um, what kind of information they were getting coming back at them. So we, uh, I asked Dr. David to take a look at it and to kind of help us think through some things like what kind of language were we using, what, yeah, from the perspective of the person who was getting it and trying to fill it out, what they might be feeling or what they may be looking at. And he offered a lot of very concrete suggestions for how to redesign it. And that's kind of where that legal design issue comes in, much many more check boxes, much more white space, things that it wasn't quite as dense, um, not as much narrative on behalf of the person who was trying to fill it out, and yet trying to make sure that they were getting the information that was helpful in the prosecutor's office to be able to move forward with cases easier. Um, and Shelly, if you want to yell at me for using this without giving you fair warning, um, feel free. Um, but it's it was really aimed at trying to help them be more efficient in their reviews and what was going on. I would just, I would say, just say that, that I thought it actually very helpful to get the feedback and it 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 worked as designed. I'm getting a lot more information that I'm finding useful um, based on the petition that we revamped. So um, it's been very good. That's, that's really great to hear because I wasn't sure of, of an update. And part of this, you know, when we were working together on this was me using my knowledge of survey design. You know, I, I, as a sociologist and psychology double major, I've had I, umpteen, as my grandmother would say, umpteen, I don't know if that's an actual number, but my grandmother thought so, umpteen research methods classes. And so thinking about it, not as an intake document, but applying a different lens to it, survey design lens, and which also leads us into survey design as a feature of trying to make sure that those you're surveying can understand what you're writing. And a very close reading of the lines and the layout, the form and the function of everything to try to create a, a, a more easily usable or a, a more usable document. That's great and to hear. Go ahead, Marissa. It, there's a question from Adele about whether what you have on the screen is the before or after. This is, I believe, this I didn't have the after. I we had the the ones we sent back and forth. This is the before, I believe. Um, I think so, and that's why I was asking for you all to comment because I was looking through my 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 versions, and I don't think I had the final after, so I wasn't able to provide it. But Adele, I do have before and afters in the next slides, to to regale you with some, some actual concrete ones. But if, if folks you know, wanna make this available as you know, the after version, as well as we might be able to provide if we, you know, we, the three of us can get together and think about it, um, create a time, you know, basically a time-lapse version of like where it started and where it ended and the changes that were made, I think would be a useful thing to also provide. Now this one right here this is from another Innocence Project, and this is the, definitely the before. <laughs> um, an Innocence Project that shall remain nameless. This was the original document. This is an intake doc. This is part of an intake document that would be sent out to those who are petitioning to have their cases evaluated. And this was, what, this was how it looked. So again, text boxes are great on its own. On its own, it might not seem so bad, and I'm not saying it is bad. But I think there were like seven or eight pages that looked like this. And part of design, I don't know if anybody has ever had an art background, ever take art classes. Oh, Adele, how would you change it? Well, let me, let me get to these examples and talk about that for here. I think this will help. On its own, this might not seem to be terribly burdensome, right? 
it might be that it looks pretty good, but if this is page after page after page of dense text that is layered on top of each other, the overall experience of it, and again, using art terms, the gestalt, the whole of it can be burdensome, can, can exert a higher cognitive load. So as I was looking at this, I said, well, what if we turn this into something like this? Right? It's essentially the same. I didn't change any wording because we might have tweaked a little bit because the wording was there for a particular reason. Again, there was needs on the behalf of the Innocence Project to have categories identified. At the same time, there's a need on behalf of the people using it to have a document that might seem more usable, that they can engage with more directly. And here the fixes were relatively simple. Um, taking out the G, because what purpose does a G serve? Now, if I'm creating a hierarchy for me institutionally, or if I'm making something in Word, having that hierarchy, right, makes sense. It's automatic. It helps to separate elements of it. Is it necessary? What, you know, is it a point where something as small as having those features in a document makes it more difficult to use? And the key here is not for me and not for you, but for the person using it. That's the lens or whomever is using it. So what I suggested here as a redesign was evidence as a marker. Makes it easier to see what it is that what section this is about. G doesn't tell me what, set, what this section is about. To know what the section's about, I would have to read all of these words. Now I know what the section's about just by seeing that one term, evidence. What kinds of evidence do the police or prosecutors have against you? Please check all the boxes that apply uh, next to the type of evidence used in your case. Small modifications of the language here. And then using some very basic icons. I designed this, by the way. I'm pretty sure I designed this in Microsoft Word. This is not Photoshop. This is not GIMP. This is not even Publisher. I'm 95% sure that it was either it's in Word it might have been in publisher. I use that sometimes too. These icons here, I got from a website, and I'll put it into the um, into the documentation. If you go to the website called the Noun Project, it's a site where you can use free iconography, and it's in the chat for people to, to, to take, take a look at. I also created. Um, these subcategories and a little bit of a different layout to save space in the document. So let me pause. I mean, what are people's reactions? I saw Nancy said, wow, thank you, Nancy. I hope that's a good wow, because there wasn't wow, that's great. Or wow, I can't believe you wasted time doing that. I'm hoping it's the good wow, not sure. Any reactions to this? Wow, that's great, there we go, thanks. And I would also say, does this make it easier for the people doing the intake to use? And that was part of the conversation too. So talking with folks within this Innocence Project, asking them in terms of their process of intake, does this make their lives easier? Trying to create that better integrated design across the groups. And so this is a prototype. On the right-hand side, uh, the evidence one is a prototype of, of what I was creating for the folks. Any other feedback or responses about that? Or questions about how I did it or how we approached it? And there could be other things we do as well. I like the content so the design just makes it more usable, hence wow. Yeah, I mean, it's very small. I, 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 I'm not, I am not a trained designer, so don't get me wrong. Um, but you know, I've been around enough designers that just thinking a little bit more visually can help with the experience and the interaction between the people and the documentation. 
and thank you, Eric. I think the icons are helpful too. And again, and by the way, it was fun for me a little bit because now I get to be creative, right? This on the left-hand side, purely functional, it works. Nothing wrong with it. Fine. On the right-hand side, creating it was for me and for some of you who like have that creative itch, it might be fun to think more creatively about what it is that you're doing in your documentation. Le Leanne says this will make data entry easier too. I, yeah, I, ho I definitely hope so. I definitely hope so. And you know, we're still working with the design, but I think we're making progress. If, if you like that, hopefully you'll love this. So this was from the same Innocence Project, the case flow. So I was provided with this document that was meant to be the case flow for a person who's asking to have their case evaluated by the Innocence Project. And so the design challenge here was how to represent the features of that case flow in a way that is easier to follow and understand while still adequately informing potential clients of the process. So it's not just how do we make it look better because it has to do certain kinds of legal work and institutional work and you can't lose sight of that. And so I was trying to focus on, for the example I wanna show you here, I was focusing on this. Stage two, evaluation. Questionnaire is returned. Record goes into a file. Questionnaire goes into queue for, for, for review. I mean, again, you can start to see here that it might make sense internally, but it's, it really isn't written for necessarily the people who are the clients. And we all do this. We all speak in language that we're familiar and comfortable with, especially when we're doing our jobs. It's just easier. And I totally get that. I do the same thing. The question then becomes, well, how can we turn this process, right, which is an attempt at a flow chart, right, into something that's a little bit easier to understand. This was my prototype that I created right there. This was in Publisher. <laughs> I know this was in Microsoft Publisher. So, you know, it's reading from the top left to the bottom right. Right? I doubt the case processing flows charts for the clients. So yes, if you're sending it to the clients, it would be different. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, it's a good question, Adele. I might be slightly wrong in that, but it is internally for the people as well. And one of the things I was told was people internally um, might not know. And I also think, could you put something like this on a website, right? So if a person goes to the website who is interested, so then it could be for the client. It could be for anybody who is looking at information for the organization. But, and I think that in particular for those who are associated with conviction integrity units, and you're thinking about this issue of transparency and how do we kind of translate what we do for the general public or for the people that we serve, some kind of flowchart like this might be something you want to consider as opposed to having it as a narrative on your website or as available in an annual report or something else that might be publicly available. Yeah, thanks, Marissa, quite right. And not that the narrative doesn't work or couldn't work, but this also provides another entree into the internal dynamics and processes of the organization for potentially a broader group of people. And the narrative, this doesn't necessarily replace the narrative, they can work together. And in the, in the prototype that I created, you can't see it here, there is space at the bottom for a narrative to also refer back to the iconography. Uh, thanks, Shelly, great idea for transparency. Again, thank you, not a big change. I added an icon to the top just to kind of set that off visually because it was a lot of blue space. Um, the dotted line to show that if more information is needed, a letter is sent to back to the inmate. And just trying to allow people to see how it flows through. And again, I'm not saying this is like the perfect, and yes, absolutely, Lauren, you can have a copy of the slides. Not that this is a perfect representation. I'm sure if you had somebody with graphic design skills, they might, not might, they probably could do a better job. But even me, 
with my limited graphic design skills, and trust me, they are very limited, was able to create this. And I think that, you know, in some ways, me telling you that I created this is easier than someone who went to design school, where someone could say, well, yeah, you created that, you went to design school. I did not. I did not. I, I am at age 50 right now trying to learn how to draw finally. I finally like, you know, you know, pandemic, you know, life goals. <laughs> I'm trying to learn how to draw. And, but it's, it's thinking just, in, you know, one of the things I do is I just went online, typed in flow, flow charts and flow models and flow diagrams, looked and saw what was there, saw what I liked and went, okay, how can I use, again, the noun project to find icons that I can then build into some kind of flow chart. And there, you know, I have, I have stage one as well. I'm working on stage three and four as well. I first wanted to get feedback from the group I was working with before going on to stage three and four. Um, but yeah, they, they, you know, the idea was, yeah, this is better. And if I could um, do those other ones for them as well. Keith says, from the perspective of a data stats nerd, a well-organized questionnaire can help with data coding for research. Amen, Keith. And that's where using my skills from survey design, which, you know, I've got a lot of training in survey design and I've done survey design before. Also thinking about how we group things together and how a survey can be followed by the person so that the person doesn't dump out of the survey. Now here, clearly, it's different. If I send a questionnaire to an inmate who wants to challenge his, her, their conviction, they're very motivated to complete it. So I don't have to worry about them dumping out as I, if I was trying to collect data, but I can still apply that same mindset, that same you know, client centricity, human centricity. I can still apply those same perspectives in survey design, which generally is aimed at the group that we're trying to survey in this kind of questionnaire design as well. Which then, you know, and quite frankly, Keith, if I was trying to do this as a larger project, I would sit down and watch the people coding in the materials they were getting back to understand what their needs were. They would be part of the design process. The, uh, the person who was the executive director of the organization would be part of the design process. The people filling it out would be part of the design process. An assumption might be made by someone, this would be an erroneous assumption, that I need to speak in more plain language because people in prison don't understand legal talk. And that would be an incorrect assumption, <laughs> I'm guessing, that you can find people who are incarcerated, who know the law and know how to legalese as well as many attorneys do. So it's not just, you know, so it's, it's you want to challenge your assumptions too, but they're only one user of this. So if, if there are people who are interested in this material from a website, can we provide that for them, for another audience? And that goes back to that ecosystem mapping. Who are the stakeholders that we're trying to reach? Um, donors, right? Press people, citizens, whomever. The, they're also could be possibly part of this design process. Any other thoughts or comments or feedback on or suggestions? This is not in any way, shape or form perfect. If anybody has any suggestions that this is giving them ideas, by all means, I'm all ears. I'm, I'm happy to uh, design on the fly here as we talk about this. And so rethink, oh, Keon, go ahead. I was going to say, have you found uh, interactive videos to be helpful too, uh, to explain the process, um, you know, explaining what's going on as much as graphics? Yeah, thank you, Kian. Uh, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked that. Yes. And one of the things I was experimenting with over the summer for another climate, I was doing a, an online education series for a client as consulting work around housing literacy. So I started, make, I started experimenting with this project or this, this program I'm going to type it into the chat called Toonly. Toonly allows you to make animations without being an animator. And so I made a lot of animations over the summer to explain the home buying process. 
And so part of me is thinking, I didn't have time to do it with this. Could we make animations, cartoon animations that would explain these processes in three minutes that someone could watch and, uh, and get the same information? The answer is yes, we could easily. And with that, with a project like Toonly, um, it's not terribly hard. It was a little bit of a learning curve and there are all kinds of issues with the project, with, with the program, I mean, but it is moderately usable. And so either having a person on camera speaking or using, um, using you know, and if people are curious about that, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to chat with you more about it and show you some examples. Using a program like Toonly to make those kinds of animations that are videos to help explain these, these kinds of things. If anybody's buying a home and wants to look at housing literacy videos, just hit me up. I'll share them with you. Let me see here, that one. Rethinking documentation and communication as well as the design of processes and service delivery from multiple perspectives, multiple perspectives can result in small changes that can have major impacts. And again, small changes. I would consider this a small change, really. I would consider right, this a small change. Didn't cost anything in terms of extra resources, no money. Cost a little bit in terms of time, not much, but can have major impacts on people's understanding, inclusion, and work, right? Make their work better as well. So um, we have 15 minutes left. Um, let me stop. There's my email. I'll also put it into the chat if people want to reach out to me. You're more than welcome to. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff further. I like it. It's fun. And with that, I'll, you know, any questions, comments, reactions, thoughts, anything else that people want to talk about in relation to legal design communication and the examples that we that, that we provided. So what it just kind of before as folks are getting their questions or comments together in their head just want to especially thank thank you Gary so much for sharing um, your time with us and also for all the help you've already given some of the folks who are on this call and and helping us kind of walk through some of these issues and, and just thinking as lawyers we tend to kind of think that we have all the answers so it's a little refreshing to be told that no we don't in a way that is not as uh, intimidating as others might have thought. So, but one as, of, of course, as a professor, make I find people. that refreshing that, that that lawyers think they have all the answers. Oh, without a doubt, without I a doubt. I thought it was us, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll, we'll cone that. Um, so please, folks who have, if you have questions for um, for Gary and other, uh, you just kind of one offs, please let us know. Um, right now, you can put them in the chat. I'll raise a hand, unmute, however you want. Um, and of course, we will be providing the materials that we discussed here. Uh, we'll be posting it on the YouTube channel where we have all these videos collected. And actually, this is a good time to kind of say that we will actually be launching a website, I think this week, um, aimed at for prosecutors who are putting together conviction integrity units, kind of pulling a lot of this stuff together so that they have them and we'll absolutely include this presentation with the PowerPoints as we do that. But here's the opportunity for anybody to be able to ask questions or um, even pushback, if you want, on some of the things that we've talked about today. Oh, pushback, always welcome. Marissa, I would just say that um, I'm, I'm very happy with how the petition turned out that we're using in Jacksonville, and I'm glad to share that. I think it's much more visibly pleasing. It's easier it's more, it's more understandable, I think, for somebody um, who is incarcerated to use it. It's user-friendly. I think I am getting um, the kind of information that you know I need. And so if anybody has an interest in getting a copy of the petition that you helps me with, I'm, I'm glad to share it. I think I've actually provided a copy of it to you and they can reach out to you or to myself. Great. Thank you, Shelley. And, and yes, we do have that kind of as a template in Word available for anybody who wants it, um, you know, obviously taking out that particular prosecutor's office name and letting you kind of fill in the gaps. 
of what you need. So it, we do have that at the center and happy to provide that. I think it's actually also going to be on the website when that gets launched as well for anybody who wants it. But thanks, Shelley. Any other thoughts or reactions that folks might have or inspirations? Inspirations are always welcome. We can always use, I'll use a little inspiration or ideas for other kinds of approaches and things, resources we might use for furthering our ability to communicate with broader audiences to create more inclusive legal processes. So before we start to lose people though, and, then, and not to discourage people from asking questions, but I want to also kind of premiere for the next two months from March and April, um, presentations will be on DNA. So Don Boswell, who headed the Tarrant County Conviction Integrity Unit um, and is now um, off doing forensics full time, she will be doing a two part series with us on DNA for understanding DNA, reading reports, interpreting it, pretty much anything you wanted to know, but we're too afraid to ask. We've got you covered over the next couple months. Um, so absolutely look out for those invitations as they go out. So that will be for next week under the grant where that's being sponsored under the grant. Um, and we're welcome everybody to have to join us then. So with that, whatever questions or comments you have for Dr. David, here's your chance. I think Keon, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, have you seen principals, um, you know, go into the prisons and, you know, present on their units before and how have they done that uh, effectively? Uh, you know, at, in Minnesota, we visited five prisons and held listening sessions with incarcerated people. And I'm wondering if, you know, it's an effective method at all to get this out and how we can do it uh, in an interesting way. I don't have any information on that, so I'll turn it over to greater minds than mine. <laughs> So I do know that some prosecutors have done that, Keon, have gone out. It's a little bit tricky to be able to get in to the prisons. You have to kind of make a lot of arrangements, as you know, um, to do that. But to kind of be able to go in and, and talk about the unit, about what you do, what you don't do, can be very helpful in terms of trying to um, both encourage the people who would be interested in sending in an application or working with you to do so, but also kind of heading off bigger, you know, issues of cases that you can't help on or you're not set up to handle, it can be pretty helpful. But in terms of like those, so things that we're talking about today would be very helpful for you in terms of preparing materials to take with you to be able to hand out to folks to kind of explain that process and what your criteria are going to be and how people can work with you. These are the types of things you might want to keep in mind when preparing materials that you're going to be using in those kinds of meetings. Yeah, absolutely. If I can piggyback on that for a second, um, you know, the idea of death by PowerPoint is probably the greatest <laughs> crime that academics have committed against humanity. As I like to tell people, you know, most academic uh, PowerPoint presentations have more bullet point have more bullets than an armory. And so this is where trying to think differently. And I've actually taken some workshops, not given, but taken workshops in uh, visual storytelling and using mind maps to, to identify images that help to reinforce uh, different kinds of concepts. Reducing word count on a slide to be more effective in terms of you know, generating understanding. So I, even though I didn't go into it here, that these same kind of principles or you know, in terms of the approach can be applied as well to um, any other materials, whether they be handouts, whether they be website materials or PowerPoint presentations. Any other ideas or thoughts as we start to wind down for today? So Dr. Dave, one question um, would be that if folks would like you to take a look at their materials or give some feedback, is something that you would be willing to do? Yeah, sure. And yeah. if so, how much does that cost them? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's hard to say, right? I mean, just reach out to me and we can have a conversation um, about it, what your needs are, how, ex how extensive it is, how much time it would take. You know, uh, one of the things that so sociologists might be good at a lot of things, one of the things we're very bad at is pricing. 
So, you know, just reach out to me and we, we can see, I can see how I can help. If it's something that's really quick, you know, probably wouldn't cost anything. If it's a longer, more intensive project, then we can talk about what that might, might, that might entail as well. But yeah, I'm always happy to have conversations around this stuff to see what might work and what might make sense. Because at the end of the day, you know, the idea is to create more inclusive environments in which understanding is, is created as well as work made more efficient and facilitated. That's, you know, this is what we're trying to do. And as a clinical sociologist, what I do is I try to help people design solutions to the challenges they're facing. And to whatever extent I can be part of that process with you all and, and who's out there today or anybody else who's listening to this, by all means, feel free to reach out to me through Bentley University or through LinkedIn as well. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. I'm glad you, I'm glad you, uh, you enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it as well. It's always great to talk to different audiences about this stuff. Uh, tomorrow, I'm talking to a medical group about designing apps for mental health. So <laughs> shifting Ooh. gears. Yeah, I know that's another topic I've worked on is design of mental uh, digital psychiatry. So that's tomorrow's talk. So yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, a lot of it's still the same, actually, but just different applications of it. So it's a lot of fun. Great. Okay, we'll give folks a couple more minutes here before um, we let Dr. David go about his day. By that, you mean deal with my children. Yeah, well, yeah, we can only give you that respite for so long, <laughs> Gary. What can I tell you? Let me translate that for you. Go about his important the, work. Yes, I have become the master at muting, covering the mouth, and screaming at the children, and then coming back to the meeting. So, The stories we will tell one another of the days we spent <laughs> Indeed. online. Indeed. Okay, well, we are, we are now at time, so I will say Great. thank you to everybody. If folks have other questions, we'll be happy to kind of hang on for a couple more minutes, but yeah. thanks again for your time today, everyone. We'll see you next month for all things DNA <laughs> for the next couple months. Nice, what a great title. Take care, everybody.